in a sermon series titled Refocus. Time to get all of our focus where it belongs on Jesus. There's so many distractions in the world that we live in. And it's high time that as Christ followers, uh, we, we, we put our energy, our time, our efforts, our focus where it belongs. And that's on Jesus. And we've been using the, the letter of 1 Peter as we've been walking through it. And if you've got your Bibles, pull them out. We'll be in, in 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning, working on the first six verses. Last week we talked about the heavenly mindset, this idea that, that suffering is part of the life of a Christ follower. Having a heavenly mindset is, is having our perspective where it belongs. And, and Peter continues this, even though we're into chapter 4, he continues this idea of where our mind is supposed to be. And, and I've titled this week's sermon, The New You. The new you. What does it look like to be a Jesus first man? What does it look like to be a Jesus first woman? It means that we live on purpose. It means that we live with purpose. We're not just buying our time and getting by. No, we're intentionally living as Christ followers. Ephesians 1.18, Paul says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. God has opened our eyes to who he's called us to be. And the hope that we have is in Christ. And so the new us, in Christ, we live this out. We're going to learn just how to do that today from our brother Peter. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. Peter writes it this way, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised. They're surprised when you don't join them in that same flood of debauchery. And then they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way that God does. Jesus, we, we, we come to you, our Savior our best friend, our everything this morning. And we ask that you would, you would come and join us. You would help us to understand what it is that we're, we're going to study. And Lord, we, we, we pray this all the time, but we, only you can open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to actually hear and, and to see what it is that you want us to hear and see. So I pray that you would do just that this morning. And I give you thanks that we get to be a part of what it is that you're doing here in and through the Anchored Church, uh, God, in this community as well. And I pray that, that you would use these, these words that you've preserved for a couple thousand years to transform our hearts and our lives into your likeness, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's just jump right into the text. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Since therefore Christ, Peter is circling back to chapter 3 been talking about suffering, what it looks like to, to submit and to surrender. And so the context stays the same. Uh, chapter 3, verse 18 is, is kind of what we're referencing back to. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So he's reiterating the same teaching about the suffering of Christ. And, and to suffer, it, it's a model that has been set by Jesus for us. It's a model uh, that is talked about often in the New Testament. It's actually mentioned 42 times in the New Testament alone about suffering. Twelve of those are in 1 Peter. Peter understood what suffering was about. He, he understood that the elect exiles were suffering because they were being obedient to Jesus. He, he understood that, so he's encouraging them. He's encouraging us today. And, and specifically what he's talking about with Jesus, this reference of suffering, it's all about what Christ culminated in his death on the cross. This is all about what Jesus did on the cross, that suffering. So you might be asking yourself, okay, if it's in the Bible 48 times, Peter's talking about it 12 times, why is he talking about suffering so much? Because it's real life for Christians. That's why. And we need to be equipped and prepared to deal with the sufferings that come. And he knew that for them, 
And that is for us today as well. And he knew too well what it was like to suffer. Peter is speaking from, from experience. See, and when people speak from experience, we pay a little more attention, don't we? About 10 years ago, I had a, a family in our house for dinner. The guy was a, a church planting coach for a network, a large, large church network in Canada. And we're having dinner, and I didn't know who he was or anything. He was a friend of a family member, and so we're just talking. And to find out what he does. He's a, he's a church planting coach. And so I was like, that's amazing. What, tell me about that. And he's telling me about all the stuff he does, all the guys that he coaches, these young pastors. And then I was like, so, so what, what churches have you planted? Like, tell me about your experience. And he's like, oh, no, I've never planted a church. And I was like, so, hold on, you're a church planting coach, but you've never planted a church. I was like, how does that work? He's like, well, I just tell them what to do. And I was like, but you don't actually know, except for what your book says. And it was a really awkward night after that point, just to be honest with you. However, he had, he had lost credibility in my mind because he was, he was trying to coach people on something he had very little experience in. That's not the case for Peter. See, we can listen to Peter because he knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to be arrested. He knows what it's like to be ridiculed. He knows what it's like to be beaten. He also knows what it's like to say, um, you judge for yourself what you're going to do and what you're thinking, but I'm going to stay true to God. So this guy that we're reading from today knows what he's talking about. We can trust what Peter is saying. Christ's followers, he's telling us today that we have to be prepared for suffering, just like Jesus did. He says, it's just, it's part of the gig. So arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. This, this verb, arm yourselves, it's, 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 it's used to encourage us, but it's, it's literally a military term, uh, refers to a soldier putting on his weapons. So picture it, visualize an, a, a soldier putting on all of his weapons. He's getting all of his weapons on. This is the mindset of a Christ follower. We have to put our weapons on. And let's be clear, Christians, we arm ourselves differently. I'm not opposed to concealed. I think it's fantastic. But this isn't about that. This is about a spiritual war that we've got to be ready to engage in. Ephesians 6.10 tells us how, how are we supposed to arm ourselves. Finally, be strong in the Lord, Paul says in Ephesians 6. In the strength of his might, Christ's followers put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We're arming ourselves according to Jesus Christ here. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul's not done. He says, I want you to take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. We've got to get armed, Paul says. And how do we do that? Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given to, given to us by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Christians fight differently. We arm ourselves differently. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. We arm ourselves differently. So picture a soldier putting on his weapons. This is what Christ followers do. We don't even get out of bed and we grab our gear. We're arming ourselves before we even start the day. That's how we arm ourselves for Jesus. And you know what? It's amazing. Christ never asks us to do something that he himself wasn't willing to do. It's one of the things I love about Jesus. Kids, Jesus armed himself with the truths of God's word. So we get armed just like Jesus did. We get in the Word every day. Every day we're to be in the Word of God to beat the devil. <laughs> we got to know how to live, right? But we also got to know what his lies are. So we've got to be in the Word to arm ourselves. You're going to starve if you rely on my preaching for one hour a week. It's not enough. Every day we are in the Word of God. should want to, right? See, we have, we have to have this same way of thinking. We've got to think like Jesus. We've got to be ready like Peter's talking about. We've got to have this mindset, this attitude of the heart, the same way of thinking. Outlook determines outcome. Cute little one-liner. But the mind is a very, very powerful thing. And we're being told today by Peter, our mindset has to be right. It's powerful. Philippians 4.8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about them. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, how you perceive things, how you think. Be transformed by the Holy Spirit's renewal of our mind. Colossians 3, set your mind on things that are above. What are you thinking about? 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Your minds are powerful. Where does your mind go when you're arming yourself? It needs to go to Jesus. It needs to go to the tools that he has given us. If Jesus would suffer for me, if Jesus loved me so much, then I will suffer for him because I love him that much. Is that true for you? So then, then what's next? He, he says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. This is the attitude of Jesus Christ being lived out in our lives. This is the attitude of the new you, not who you used to be. That guy, that gal, that is not who you are anymore. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has literally ceased from sin. When a believer truly, fully surrenders, when a, when a believer completely identifies themselves with Jesus Christ, they're done with sin. It's a line in the sand is what this means. When you are firmly rooted in Christ, this is how it applies to you. It means that Christ followers, we live a life abandoned to sin. We don't manage it. We don't play with it. We don't toddle it a little bit, tolerate it at all. No, 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 we're done with it. We've ceased from it because we are being called to this level of, of persecution. We're being called to this level of suffering. We're being called to this level of loyalty with Jesus. And it means that we've got to cease from sin. It doesn't mean we're going to do it perfect. It doesn't mean we're going to do it perfect. Jesus does it perfect. That's why we need him. But it does mean that we're called to be sinless. And as you well know, that means that we sin less and less every day because we love Jesus more and more. We cease from our sin. It means to be done with. In the Greek, Peter chooses the, the perfect tense in the verb, this verb sense. And that might mean nothing to you, but perfect tense indicates that an action occurred in the past and its effects are in the future. And so it means something happened back here, but the effects come later. That's what this, this verb style means. And, and what we know is that Jesus Christ suffered and he took all of our sins on the cross. That was the event that happened. But what happens in the future is because of that, we can now cease from our sin. We can now be done with it all because of what he did for us. And it does not say in here that suffering itself causes a person to stop sinning. We know that's not true. Look at Pharaoh. <laughs> that dude suffered over and over, and he just got worse. It didn't turn him to repentance. His suffering made him bitter. How many people do you know that go through life, and the more suffering they experience, the more bitter that they get? That's why we need Jesus, because we suffer differently. So when we suffer, it causes us to cease from our sin, not go to it. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. If Christ has died for me, I cannot trifle with the evil that killed my best friend. He died for you. So be done with your sin. We should hate our sin because it's what killed him. Christians don't tolerate sin. We don't manage our sin. We cease from it. And we too, we need to have this commitment, this mind, this armoring of ourselves because, because it come, when it comes to suffering, Jesus has us right where he wants us. And this is what he's calling us, uh, calling us to. And, and this leads us to, to the next step. So, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Look at, look at the, the, the comparison here. This is the result of us surrendering to Jesus Christ. Big pictures, Christ followers, we arm ourselves. Right with the truths of God, we arm ourselves like like a, a military man getting getting ready to go to war. It means that we've been set free from our life of sin because we're ceasing from it because we love Jesus so much. As to live the rest of our time, as long as we're going to be on earth, the rest of our lives, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. 
the new you does things a little different. The new you not only draws a line in that sand, but doesn't actually go up to it anymore. Because you want to cease from this sin. You want to be done with this human passions. You guys know, James says, life is but a mist and a vapor. And it's over. Live your lives on purpose. Live your lives, the rest of your lives, no longer for the flesh, no longer for temporary pleasures, no longer for what just makes you happy or you think is going to make you happy. It's not worth it. It means we die to ourselves, not just to our physical desires, but, but those, si those sinful, thoughtful cravings that we have. All of those gotta, gotta go. The new you doesn't give in to addictions or vices or excuses anymore. That was the old you. <laughs> that, that, it's done. Out with the old, in with the new. That is not for Christ followers, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. You either obey or you disobey. That's it. Our past is who we were, but because of Jesus, our present and our future is who we are. He has transformed us into the likeness of his image, into God himself. We get, to, we get to chase after holiness and pursue righteousness now. No longer what we want, no longer the passions of the flesh. Kids, Jesus first men and women deny the flesh and pursue what God wants. Peter talks about this exact thing four times in this letter alone. He's like, I need you to get it. I need you to get it. I need you to get it. We're to keep away from anything that doesn't look like Jesus. And it's pretty obvious what is not of Jesus. And so how you live your life on display is what you believe. And so if you're living your life like a sinner and a pagan and a non-Christian, well, let's just call it what it is. But if you hate your sin, you're chasing after Jesus, you're trying to do what's right, now we're starting to talk. Now we're talking. Now we're starting to cease from our sin. Because we're chasing what is right, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. I love how Peter just makes things black and white. He, he doesn't leave a lot of ambiguity in this one at all, right? We talk about there's team Jesus, there's team Satan, there's really only two teams. Well, this is exactly what Peter's saying. There's flesh and there's God's will. They're, they're diametrically opposed to each other. So you choose. It's up to you how you want to live your life. For those that are Christ followers, you will then cease from sin. You will no longer pursue the passions of the flesh, but for the will of God. The will of God is what he wants for you. His highest and best calling for you. It's you saying no to sin and yes to him. That's what this is. You chase after the flesh. You, you reap shame and condemnation and guilt and havoc on your marriages and your homes and your businesses and your churches and your communities and your relationships because you chased this but then now God says I want you to chase my will I want you to chase what I want for you I want you to chase what is right and righteous and you'll reap blessing you'll reap favor you'll reap contentment in a crazy broken world you'll still have contentment no longer for human passions but for the will of God Christ followers that is our calling Team Jesus and God's will. No more excuses, no more justifications. Maybe you just, maybe you did it wrong this week and you're like, I'm done doing it wrong. I'm done. Jesus, I just want to do your will. Forgive me for not doing it right. He goes on, he says, the time that has passed suffices for, for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. He says, you used to live like that. You used to live like a Gentile. You used to live like a non-Christian, but no, 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 not anymore. That, that was the old you. The new you, uh, that's not you. That's not who you are. Acts 17, 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. The new you no longer enjoys your sin. The new you no, no longer uh, it pleads, can plead ignorant because God has revealed to you what is sin and what is not. So now you're held to an account. So God's not going to overlook that. We don't get to plead the I don't know card or I didn't know. Because we do know. We do know what God's calling us to. So we just have to, have to do it. The new you in Christ should hate your sin. Hate all sin. Because God does. See, and, and it's, it, the that time has passed. It's no longer for Christ followers. We don't, we don't get to live like our non-Christian neighbors and, and, and to do what the Gentiles want to do. Their desires are for sin. It's what they want. 
They want to sin. Christ followers, our desires are to do the will of God, not to sin, right? So Peter, what he does, he gives us this amazing black and white list, again, Peter, black and white, about living in sensuality. What is this actually? He gives us some pretty decent details, so it doesn't leave much for, uh, I'm not sure exactly what he meant here. No, he, we know exactly what he meant, because he says they, were, they want to live in sensuality. In the Greek, it's actually plural. It means all kinds of sin. It doesn't just mean sexual sin. It, it means evil appetites. He's, they, they have this desire to do evil. They just want it. They just, it's what they crave. Does that sound like Jesus to anybody here? No. 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 Non-Christians, they, 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 it means they disregard uh, a majority of, of self-restraint and self-control. They just give in because it's what they want. Only you can answer what you truly want. And so he gives us this list of what these things of sensuality are. Passions. It means you have an appetite for sin. You have a desire, this evil desire to want what's not yours. Desire for what is forbidden. That's this, the, these passions. Of, and, and then another one would be drunkenness. It, it means overflowing with wine. Overflowing with wine. It, it, the King James says wine babbler. It's, just, it's overflowing. Let's be super clear. Alcohol is not a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. Christ followers, we do not get drunk. We cannot be out of our mind. The devil has a playground when we're high or drunk. Right. And it is not for Christ followers whatsoever. Amen. So this idea of overflowing, I mean, I look at Paul, he says in Ephesians 5, don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. And he says, do the opposite, be filled with the Spirit. And then he goes on, he says, don't, don't, don't get no drunkenness. He says, these orgies. Let me give you a backdrop here. So back in the day, first century, non-Christians used to have these festivals, these parties. It was a worshiping event to gods, okay? So this is what non-Christians did. And, and one of their favorite was for Bacchus. If you've ever heard of him, he's the god of wine. And they would have these festivals to Bacchus, and they would have these worship times, and it would be all of these things. It is drunkenness, it's passions, and then they have these orgies because all the alcohol, it just allows for all this extra sin to come in. And they did things that are deplorable, things that I won't even mention from the pulpit. Use your imagination, and it says, this is not for Christ followers. Zero, zilch, zip, nada. You can see why God is against this. Hebrews 13, 4, let the marriage bed be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Not for Christ followers. Intimacy was created by God. One man, one woman married before him. That's how he created it. Anything outside of that is sin. Anything outside of that is against God's law. Homosexuality, yes, against God's law. It's against what he wants. Orgies obviously would be against what God wants. Anything outside of a sanctified marriage bed is sin. From what we watch, to social media that we scroll, to books that we read, to music that we listen to, Christ followers, we do it different. We do it holy, we do it set apart. And we can't be a part of this. And then drinking parties is actually a different word than drunkenness, but it kind of means the same things. It literally means a drinking party. It means that there is an intent and a desire to have excess. So this is what you're going in. You're going in knowing that this is going to be a crazy party, knowing that you're going to, to give in to the overflowing of wine, knowing that you're going to plan on sinning. Not in the life of Christ followers. Doesn't look like Jesus. And he ties it all together with the, the, uh, the culmination of lawless idolatry. It means to worship the created and not the creator. And God is not playing second fiddle to anything. So it's lawless, it's going against what he wants, and it's idolatry and it's an abomination before God. By worshiping the creature instead of the creator, the sinner violates God's command not to have any other gods before him. It's a command of God, not a suggestion. With respect to this uh, theologian, Pastor John Bengal, he observes that the most sacred law of God is then violated. God has got to be first in our lives. Not your spouse, not your work, not your hobbies, not your passions. God has got to be first in the lives of Christ followers. 
has to be first. Can you see how this whole list behind me is not to be a part of any of our lives? Even more than that, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Those that do these go to hell. They will not inherit. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, Paul says. Such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified by Jesus Christ. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You have been set free from all of these things. No longer for Christ's followers. Choose this day whom you will serve and then go do it. Kids, Christ's followers can't be chasing sin and Jesus at the same time time they are opposing teams peter's described the life of a worldly non-christian we have to be diametric diametrically opposed to all of these things and live that life out not just talk about it so peter explains how how how, uh, he keeps going how different we're supposed to be he says with respect to this so with respect to all of these sins they're surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you In a world of sin, Christ followers, you have to set yourselves apart. They're not going to mock you and be surprised if you're joining them. So we don't get to join them. We we too are supposed to be living as exiles, just passing through, not partying with all of our non-Christian friends. We're not supposed to feel at home in this environment. Okay? So with respect to all of these sins, we shouldn't be a part of it. It comes, all of this comes with a cost. They're surprised when you don't join them in this same flood of debauch. Why don't you just jump in? You too good for us? What's the matter with you? You used to do this all the time. You're like, well, no, that's not who I am anymore. And they're shocked. They're like, why wouldn't you? You always used to. And maybe you never were the guy that was into orgies, drunkenness, lawless idolatry, and all the parties. Maybe that was never you. But maybe, just maybe, you had some stuff in your life that's not on that list, but surely didn't look like Jesus either. doesn't have to be all the extreme stuff. (laughs) Maybe you just, you can fill in your own blank about who you used to be and what Jesus Christ has set you free from. And so now when you don't join in, when others are doing that, they are surprised. And this, this wording of flood of debauchery, it, it, it's, the word flood here, it indicates an overflowing. It, it's a dissipation. It, it's this idea of a repeat offender. This is what they do. Psalmist talks about this. The Proverbs talk about this. This, this, this continual love of sin. It means to live like a prodigal in excess. And that doesn't look like Jesus. They're surprised you don't join them. We have to live our lives in such a way that we'll actually be maligned, that we'll be mocked, we'll be persecuted. You have to be living your lives in such a way that they are doing that. And that's going to happen on purpose. But see, we're in good company. I, I, look at, I look at our best friend, my Savior, your Savior, Jesus Christ. John 15, he says, If the world hates you, you need to know that it hated me before it hated you. And it's not like it's some competition between us and Jesus. He's saying they're going to hate you because they hate me. He says in 19, If you were of the world then the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with not having everybody be your friends? Everybody think you're just the greatest person in the world? Jesus says, you love me, they're going to hate you. That's not for people pleasers. This is a challenge for those of us that are youngest in the family. Are you okay with people not liking you because of your faith in Jesus Christ? Not because you're mean or because you're, you're something you shouldn't be, but because you love Jesus. Are you okay? They will malign you. They will go against you. And guess what? When Christians act like sinners, you completely blow your witness to tell them about how amazing Jesus is. So we have to live our lives in such a way, the new us, in such a way that everything we do and say honors God. Non-Christians, they actually have to, have to have the same thing that we have to have, this idea of, of judgment. Peter says, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. 
It's basic bookkeeping. There's a ledger, basically. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 12. He says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak, for by your words you'll be justified. And by your words you'll be condemned. We have to give an account of how we live our lives, as do they. Who do they stand before? Who do we stand before? Yahweh. Creator God. That's who we stand before. They, who, we know this. He is ready to judge the living and the dead. Judgment is a future day that's coming. It's called Judgment Day. It's not a movie. It's an actual event that's going to happen. This is literally going to happen. There will come a day when, when, when God judges the entire world. Now the difference is, is they don't have Jesus standing between them and God. I do not want any of you to go to Judgment Day without Him as your Savior. For those that are still alive, there's hope. For those that are still alive, there's a chance. But no one, and I mean absolutely no one, gets to escape the judgment of God. The unsaved may judge us, but one day God will judge them and us. And instead of arguing with them, maybe we should be praying for them. Because we know that final judgment will happen. But see, our hearts should be for their salvation. Is that your heart? I know what I've been set free from, and I never want to go back, and I want that for everybody I meet. I don't want them to stand before God's throne without Jesus as their advocate. This is the heart, 2 Timothy 2, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, and God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. God may perhaps grant them, but it's our job to come and, and share God's truth and share what he's done and to live our lives in such a way that they're surprised, to live our lives in such a way that they malign you. It still gives us opportunity to share with them the good news of Christ. Kids, our heart's desire should be for everyone to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Don't back down from the opportunity to share about how good God is. Somebody shared it with you. Maybe a lot of people had to share it with you to get, get you to where you're at. Be that for somebody. There's still time. We should want this, though, for everybody. And he goes on in 6. He says, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That they, they judged in the flesh the way people are. They might live in the spirit the way, the way that God does. And just like all scripture, we have to interpret this verse in context, okay? Because the context here is suffering as Christ's followers. The context here is suffering for doing what is right before the Lord. And if you took this verse out of this context, it almost sounds like there might be a chance for uh, a, a, a salvation after death. And that's not at all what it means. This is about for Christ's followers to be, to be suffering for Jesus. And so Peter's reminding his readers, Peter's, Peter's reminding us of the Christians who had been martyred for their faith. Quite simply, the, the dead here are those Christians who, who heard the gospel, they believed the gospel, and, and, and then they died. That's who he's talking about. They had been falsely judged by men. Men do this, don't we? We judge. We, we shouldn't, right? But they, we falsely judge. And it says here that they received their judgment. And even though man judged them for living out their faith, they finished strong. And yeah, man may judge all the time, but that's in the flesh. And the big picture here is that believers, before, before they knew that they had accepted, before, excuse me, that they, they already accepted the gospel in faith, they knew they had to face death, just like every one of us does. Every one of us in this room will face death. Jesus comes back before, okay, we got to get out of jail free card. That's going to be an amazing day, and I hope I'm around. But apart from him coming back, all of us here will face death. And so he's saying that they, they too experienced the, the judgment of men. And, and it says that, that they might live in the spirit the way that God does. And, and see, it's crazy because we're, we're hoping to finish strong, right? That's the plan, to inherit eternal life, the grace and mercy of Christ poured out on us. This verse should be an encouragement to all of us. Death, death doesn't bring a loss of salvation. It enters, it enters it in. Kids, let me put it this way. The grace of Christ is for us when we are alive, but even more so when we die. 
This includes all those who died in faith before us. And I, and I look at how Paul talks about this same, same idea in Romans 8. He said, but if Christ is in you, in verse 10, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. See, that's something to celebrate. This is something that we get to look forward to, to, to get rid of all of our sin, to pursue holiness, and to finish strong. Let, let's, let's tie this together. Have you, have you ever walked into a room that was dark, pretty dark, and you walk in, you can't see much, and then within a little bit of time, no, not much time at all, you can start to see things a little bit more? Have, am I the only one that's had this? Okay, so you can kind of start to see a little bit. I don't want you to ever get comfortable in the dark. Don't ever get comfortable in the dark. Don't ever get comfortable doing what the world does. We are to be a light in a dark world, in a dark room, and suffering and persecution are coming because we are the light in that dark room. All the more reason for us to be, to be a light. So as we, as we wrap all this up, I, I, I want to reiterate a couple of things because I, I need to drive home a couple more points. One is, is we do like Jesus did. So we're arming ourselves just like he did. Jesus used the word of God to refute and defeat the devil. Why wouldn't we do the exact same thing? Part of that, a huge part of that, is you've got to know what the word of God is. I know I plead with you every week to be in your Bible. If you signed a membership document at this church, you committed to reading your Bible every day. It's part of it. It's what we expect of you. It's what God expects of you. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be ignorant of the schemes and the lies of the devil. I want to know what he's up to. We have a playbook. We understand his game. We, we understand his tactics. And we also understand how powerful God is. So we need to know truth. Food for our soul and a weapon against the devil is the word of God. Knowing the truth, it also helps us deny the flesh. It also helps us pursue what God wants. That's good as we walk with him. That's good for our marriages. That's good for our kids. It's good for our relationships. It's good for our church. It's good for our community. Deny the flesh. Super clear, you can't chase sin and Jesus at the same time. It just doesn't work. Where are you at with that? It's easy to come to church and put on that Sunday smile. I don't want that in this church. I want honesty. You're not having a good week? Let's sit down and have a little chit-chat. Let's get us where we need to go. We don't need pretenses here. Life's too short. We're, the hourglass is running out. Why don't we just be really honest with each other so we can do better, so we can chase Jesus more, so we can help other, chase, other people chase Jesus more? Has your heart's desires changed as Christ has been working in and through you? What do you want? Passions of the flesh or the will of God to be done? To please Him? What do you want? Honestly, it's only God that can actually change our hearts. And if He's changed yours, you know how detestable sin tastes. I love what John says we've tasted, we've seen, we've touched, we know that the Lord is good. And there's no going back, right? It's like after you've had really, really, really good food and then you go to McDonald's. <laughs> Not that I'm against a Big Mac. You know what I mean, though? We've tasted, we've seen, we've touched. We know that the Lord is good. All this other stuff is garbage. It's refuse. I don't want it. But see, God's the one that changes our desires and, and, and it helps us to stop desiring sin. But we have to do our part but see, only God can change the mind. My wife and I started fighting human trafficking about 11 years ago. And when I started fighting trafficking, I had a, I had a few things that I would like to do to traffickers and pimps because I, I learned what they had done and it made me sick. It made me so angry. And I had things that I'd like them to go through. And God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, changed my heart. I pray for them now because if they had Jesus, they wouldn't be harming people. So this is our desires, to see people set free in Jesus because they're no longer going to be doing what they're doing. 
for us. He's done that for our hearts, our lives. Do you know what we've, we're capable of? But we got to live this out. God changed my heart about it. And I know that he can change yours. The very grace that Christ extended to me, he can extend to them. Charles Spurgeon, I already quoted him, but I want to do the full quote about what he said. He said, if Christ has died for me without the strength that I have, then I cannot live in sin any longer. I must arouse myself to love and serve him who has redeemed me. I cannot trifle with the evil that killed my best friend. I must be holy for his sake. How can I live in sin when he has died to save me from it? So I'll paraphrase it this way as we wrap up. I cannot enjoy my sin, the very thing that killed my best friend. We got no business in sin. Maybe you didn't do it right this week. Perfect. Now you got an opportunity to repent. We don't stay there, right? That, that's what the devil wants. He wants us to keep us right there where we're filled with guilt, shame, condemnation. Can't believe I did that. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever. That's where he wants you. But Jesus says, no, I, I came to set you free. So I need you to repent. I need you to get rid of that. I need you to be honest with your sin. And then we can deal with it. It's part of life. It's called sanctification. The Holy Spirit brings the heat of life. And in and, and, and life, we have trials. We have these temptations. We have things that happen. And, and through that, all of our infirmities come to the surface. Holy Spirit comes in and just wipes them all away. But we've got to repent of them. We've got to be done with our sin. We have to cease from our sin. Only you know where you're at today. But my hope is that you love Jesus more today than you did yesterday. And that tomorrow puts the day to shame. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. Father God, I, I, I humbly thank you for your word today. Your, your reminders, God, your commands. They're not even just reminders. Your commands on how we're supposed to live. God, and I pray that every one of my brothers and sisters here would hate their sin because they love you so much. God, I pray that you would defeat the devil in each of our lives, that you would cover us with your powerful Holy Spirit so we can go and be effective witnesses for you, sharing your message about what you've done. God, if there's stuff in our lives that shouldn't be there, I pray that you would convict us of it so we'd be free of it. And I just give you thanks, thanks, thanks for all that you've done for us. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.